Welcome to the Contemplative Life. Three pastors, friends, and spiritual companions help us explore spirituality through a contemplative lens. I'm Christina Roberts. I'm Chris Roberts. I'm Christina Kaiser. We're glad you joined us. Hello, it is great to be with you. Well, today we are going to do actually a part two of vocational discernment and how the contemplative helps with that. Um, if you tuned in last week, we had a very generative conversation and we kept recording after the fact and thought, you know, I think there's some more to say here. So let's just do a part two. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to last week's episode, you may want to check that out first and then come back to this one to listen as we continue the conversation around vocational discernment and uh, how the contemplative helps with that. So that's dive in. As we're talking, I find myself of struggling is the right word, but questioning, I'm questioning to your point, is, is this for the privileged? And part of me is tempted to say, yep, I, I recognize the privilege. And part of me is tempted to say, I think that we're hard. Like there's something in us that the divine is at work. And I don't know that it's just for the select few necessarily. I don't know. But even to your point about getting to do 90%, this person is is well advanced in his life and career too. And that wasn't always the case for him where he, you know, he incrementally kind of worked his way towards that and had to come to grips with, and this is vocationally. I don't know that he's saying his entire life is 90%. He's specifically saying with his vocation, he has gotten to the point where vocationally 90% of the work he does is stuff that he act like that he enjoys and thrives in. And as I was listening to that, and I think I reflected this to you yesterday, Chris, it's like, I feel that way too. I can honestly say what I do for my work, I thoroughly enjoy. That has not always been the case. And I think it's been a lot of reflection and difficult conversations and admitting things to my board or to other people and working together towards that. But I think I'm showing up better for my work because of that. So I don't know, am I a Lord or a lady? Am I, I don't know. <laughs> These are interesting questions. Well, I think you have a person in your life who loves to see you thrive, does some things for you that free you up to do your Dharma or whatever. Now, is that you know, equality. I don't, I don't know how to answer that question, but is, is my, is my role in, in life, uh, to be serving? Uh, is that, is that, is that my Dharma? I, I think, you know, th these are great, great questions that I don't know the answer to and getting very personal here, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, this makes me think of, I recently read a book called the dream manager, I think is what it's called. And it's one of those business books. That's a, it's a fable, a parable. And then at the end, it kind of has, you know, um, Patrick Lencioni kind of made that popular. This is not Patrick Lencioni. It's another author, but they tell a story about a business. And then the second half of the book is actual real life. This is how it works. And so this particular fable was about someone who owned a janitorial custodial company. He was a millionaire and he was um, meeting with his manager because they were having like just this huge turnover rate. Like every three months they were having to rehire. And so it was causing a lot of cost to have to train and hire new people. And some of their contract workers were saying, look, things are falling through the cracks. There's always new faces. The work is getting sloppier. And so we're going to put you on probation for 90 days. And if the work doesn't improve, we're going to go with another company. And so they decided like, we need to figure out what it is about the the turnover rate. Why are people leaving? And so the main guy was like, oh, you know, it's because they want more money. And he said, maybe, but um, I think it's important to ask the people wh what it is that that they see and, and and to get the information from them. So they decided to do a survey. And when they did the survey, overwhelmingly, the data was that people were leaving because of transportation issues, because most of them did not have vehicles. And if you're cleaning an office and getting off at midnight, it's either unsafe to be waiting at the bus stop for transportation, or if you're you know, getting off at odd hours, there's not a route or a transportation that, that goes to your neighborhood. And so it had nothing to do with not wanting the job. These people actually did want to work and needed the job, but due to transportation, they were 
were unable to do that. So um, they ended up uh, creating a shuttle system for these employees where, you know, they would drop off in the neighborhoods. And if you were getting off after a certain hour, they would take you directly to your home. So that one change increased their productivity and the turnover rate went from the average being three months to six months. So then like, okay, we're on the right track. Let's do another survey to figure this out. Like, why are people leaving? Um, So anyway, by the third the third round of this, um, someone on their team said, you know, I think in all honesty, people leave this job because let's face it, it's dead end. No one is a kid dreams of becoming a custodian. And there's only so much motivation that you can give someone cleaning stadiums and offices and vacuuming. Like that's not a glamorous job. Right. Um, and so they decided to do a survey and ask people, what are your dreams? Because she said, what if this could be a stepping stone to something as, as opposed to, I know this is a dead end job, so I'm going to just work and then go find something else. Could we be a stepping stone for people? And so um, they did this survey to determine what people's dreams were. And um, it was wonderful to kind of see like a, a majority of the dreams were to own their own home. Some people wanted to have a vacation, buy a car, Um, learn English more fluently, get a college degree, all these different things. And so as a company, they hired what they called a dream manager to meet with these people quarterly and to help them to determine what are your dreams and how can we work towards helping you get to those things. And so um, they would run seminars, like every six months, they would have financial planners come in to do a workshop on how to buy your first home and grants and and things like that. And so their turnover rate went from um, the six month to three, they're like, if we can keep people an average of three years, that's going to do so much to um, towards our bottom line and our quality. And that happened where there was a turnaround. And they also began to see as people were motivated to go to work because people cared, not just about the job that they were doing, but beyond that with some of their bigger dreams of you want to go to Florida with your family, how can we make that happen for you? Like, let's talk about ways that you can save and and work towards that with bonuses and things like that. Um, And so as a result, not only did their turnover rate go um, get, get so much better, but they noticed that their cost of supplies went down because people were becoming more efficient in how they were cleaning and showing up to work. And we don't need as much cleanser here and we can do this. And they took more pride in their work. And so I do think that there's something about in those mundane jobs that seem dead end if 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 we can create dream managers, if you will. And so there's like this consulting company that does this now. And they go to these um, these jobs that are kind of these medium, low wage sort of jobs to, to help bring this out. So to me, I think that's a lovely picture of Dharma and how, yes, we do need to vacuum and do these things, but perhaps there's ways in which we can become a bridge towards other things in our lives too that really matter. Gosh, so many ideas. I mean, first of all, can we just like applaud people that have that much vision to ask that many questions and stay on it. That just feels really meaningful. But even as you're talking, I'm realizing as a 16-year-old, I I had a choice, right? I could have chose retail or food industry. (laughs) I don't know. Like I lived in a small town. But I chose food. And all these years later, that seems like a natural choice to me. I love food. I love cooking. And even recently, I wrote all these joy lists. One of like my treats like something that brings me great joy is vacuum lines on the floor (laughs) so like actually if I just want to feel like I've accomplished something really small and meaningful probably a quick vacuum of a room would do that for me so it is there is some amount of little things we might take for granted that is uniquely a part of us Uh, so I don't know I laundry cleaning (laughs) Maybe it's all in there somehow. I don't know what's stirring for you, Chris, as we're saying all this. I like your story uh, and the story uh, of this book, um, even though it's fictitious. Um, I think, you know, this idea of making community, of um, helping others in society to thrive, um, that seems hopeful to me, right? Um, and going back to the point of, you know, Dharma, who gets to do Dharma, you know, is it just the Lord and ladies or can we, and I, I think the story is hopeful. It, it does say that we can help people reach their dreams. Um, but there, I think there, there is that state of unhappiness and unrest, which is probably helpful 
to those in in sort of dis- discovering what their goal is. Okay, so I'm unhappy being a janitor or I'm unhappy doing this. And I think that discontentment could propel you to reaching your goals. Um, so I think it does answer the question of do, do just Lord and Lord and ladies get to get to do their Dharma. Uh, but I do still think that there is an equality issue that maybe is utopian <laughs> that, that, you know, how can we equally do the thing that we're, that we're doing? And I think we just live in a world that is maybe moving towards equality, but right now with who gets, who gets spotlighted, I feel that it is, we're, that we still have a long way to go. And so to answer your question, I would love for everybody to be able to do their dharma. I would love to be able to do my dharma. I don't feel like I'm quite there. I think helping other people to to do the thing that they uniquely can do in the world is something that I want to I want to be a part of. And so I've loved this conversation just for the fact that we're talking about that. How do how can contemplation, how can the contemplative life help us to reach our goals and help other others reach theirs. And that, that's something that I can, that I can get on board with for, for, for a good while. I, I think that's something that I would like to devote my life to. So I appreciate this conversation for that. Yeah. I, I think too, thinking about the Lords and ladies, like, you know, in the movies, often it's the Lords and ladies or the ladies that, that feel discontent, right? It's like, I don't want to just be a lady sitting around doing these things with servants waiting on me hand and foot. I want to have a purpose and mission. And so that's why I wonder if there's something hardwired in us that what we're meant to do matters. And Christina, even to your point, like maybe it's not even what I'm doing, but how I feel or who I'm doing it with that matters, right? So I think that that's part of our dharma as well is, does it really matter if I'm because I think I find joy in listening to somebody one-on-one, but I also find joy in in baking or something like that as well. So what I, quote, do with my hands and life and time is maybe going to switch, um, but how I'm present to that, I think, also matters. So um, I really appreciated what you were saying about that as well. Yeah, and I think it's worth it to n- note these two ways that this can work, right? One is, for instance, I'm working in corporate America and I want to be a baker, which I feel like... I have a friend like that, right? She's really good at it and she lights up when we do these kind of volunteer, create an event type stuff. And then I think there's another one, which is I'm in this job in order to pay the bills or but I need another skill or I need something else in order to get to where I'd really wanna be. So there's really two ways that I think we're identifying that this can work and both are real as it turns out. Yeah. And I wonder too, if sometimes in our job, if, if again, we do need to pay bills, that's a reality of life. And so unless you, you know, you have some large inheritance where you don't have to do that 99% of us, that's not the case. Right. And so I, I have found too, sometimes if maybe the whole of my job isn't like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yay. Um, sometimes if there's even like a parallel track that I'm on or a side gig that I'm doing or something, somehow then what I have to do for the quote nine to five or to pay the bills is, is okay. Right. Like I know that this is part of the, the entire mosaic of my vocational life. And so this affords me the opportunity to do these things. I think sometimes that's part of the reality as well. There seems to be some like riches here. I don't know. Cause I do think it's important to name privilege. But at the same time, like, I don't know, I have this um, Rachel Rogers. She is a black female entrepreneur. And she's just this wonderful human being that really wants to see particularly women of color. um, But you know, any anybody, particularly women, um, or people that identify that way. um, and, And her whole thing is like, we should all be millionaires. And it's, you know, kind of this thing of like, really encouraging women to, um, to to lean into, business and wealth and that the way that society is going to change is by more hands, more money getting into the hands of women, because typically, statistically, women give back more to the communities and to families. And how do we switch generational wealth? So she's amazing. But she's, you know, she grew up very poor, um, ended up like working her way to go through law school, practiced law for a number of years, and then realized this isn't what I want to do. And then she ended up kind of going a different route into entrepreneurship. Even her, I appreciate because she has people on her podcast and in her world where there's such an empowering thing of like, you know, you, you, we can lean into these things and there are stirrings and there are desires and it doesn't matter 
your race or your gender or where you grew up. Like, yes, those are factors and that's part of our story, but there's permission and opportunity and an invitation to, to maybe explore these things. So I really appreciate some of what she offers as well. So, I mean, I certainly have friends in their 50s going back to school because they know that they there's this longing in their heart that they feel it and their free time moves towards it. So it's definitely a story that some of us can experience. And, and I have other friends who are in the middle of job searching and purposely turning down a job, even though it's not convenient because they know it's not exactly right. But all of these are acts of bravery. <laughs> it takes so much to say in middle life, I'm going to not just go to school like I could have done in my younger years, but I'm going to pay the bills and I'm going to go to school. That's a huge sacrifice. And I've watched my friend, you know, getting papers done at 11 o'clock at night that are due by midnight. And um, and I'm watching my friend who's looking for work feel the pain of still being unemployed in order to wait for the thing. So I think that that act of bravery <laughs> and kind of that fear that goes along with not knowing what's going to come is a big part of this story. And um, and in those two case studies, you know, not in the same country. So like we're not just dealing with American privilege. So this is a, a universal conversation, although certainly to Chris's point, trying to navigate the reality of freedoms is different from one place to another, one story to another. Well, thanks again for a wonderful conversation. And for those that are interested in learning more, we invite you to check out uh, the contemplativelife.net. We'll have some information on there about upcoming vocational deep dive days that we'll be offering for the rest of the year. And would love to see you either in person or virtually join for one of those. On that note, this is the part of our podcast where we talk about what we are into this week. So I think that we have been into fun dinner time activities. So it has been a goal of mine to create more of a playful atmosphere in the house and um, to kind of eliminate some of the struggles that might come throughout the evening. So we, I've been brainstorming things that we can do at the table, like creating a story where each person tells a sentence of it, which can take some crazy turns and usually involves a lot of bathroom humor in our house. Uh, but also the kids love play on word jokes and stuff like this. So that has been the thing that I have been into lately. Nice. So I've, you know, from our conversations that we've had last week and this week, I've been into like, what are, what are small ways that I can like ask questions of people to uncover some of their dreams. So I stand around waiting for my kid to get off school and I'm with uh, other parents and I'm like, how can I, how can I ask small little questions that can open them up for discovering, you know, what are, what are, what are some things that you're into? And, and so I'm always looking uh, for ways to do community development or or engage with others in my community. And so I, I've really enjoyed these conversations because it's triggered this desire in me to want to ask people, what are your dreams? And so that's what I've been into. Um, so I am into beef sticks. Uh, we recently, our daughter organized a little fun run with some of her friends to try to raise money for an orphanage. And so, uh, one of the families owns like a meat company. And so they brought some beef sticks for the kids after the race and we had popsicles and these were really good beef sticks. And I am always on the hunt for different kind of like meat to go kind of options as we're, you know, hiking or on the road. And so, um, we had those and then, um, we were at Costco the other night and we have certain go-to beef jerky, beef stick type things that we did. And we branched out. There was, um, one on sale. I'm like, Ooh, I've been curious about this one. Let's try this one. And we're kind of comparing what type of beef sticks, um, and beef products that we like. So that is what I am into this week is all things beef related. So that could <laughs> And my partners are laughing about my what I'm into this week, those of you who cannot see the screen. Well, um, thanks for joining us this week on The Contemplative Life, and uh, we uh, look forward to being with you again next week. Take care. Bye.